Hello and welcome to the Tillage Edge with me, Michael Hennessy. This is your regular update for all your tillage news and advice. The Russian aggression in the Ukraine shows no signs of easing and our hearts go out to all the people of Ukraine, especially in the people in the besieged cities of Mariupol and Kharkiv. The human cost and overall damage to the country is incalculable. One of the consequences of the conflict is that many countries across the world, including Ireland, are beginning to look at their national food security. Ukraine and Russia combined account for about 30% of globally traded wheat, with both countries supplying significant supplies of maize, barley and vegetable oils. It's an unknown at this stage as to what will happen to farming in Ukraine in 2022 and if planted crops will be brought to harvest or if spring crops will get sown. A question also hangs over Russian grain production due to the limited input supplies and also with their capacity to export grain may be limited. Getting an insight into what might happen in the coming months is difficult, but it's always better to talk to somebody in that region. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Jim McCarthy, managing partner in Southern Harvest Romania, who is farming close to the border in Western Ukraine. Jim, you're very welcome to the podcast. And firstly, Jim, how are you and your family? And are you feeling any effects of the war as you live close to the border? The family are all good, Michael. Um, Liam, my son, is here with us. He's married for a great Romanian girl, Christina, and they have a, a seven-month-old son. So he's got a fine Romanian name called Will McCarthy. Um, Very good. And uh, now they're all good. You know, they're concerned about the war. We all are concerned. We're 60 kilometers from the Ukraine border, the border crossing in Siret, and we're 50 kilometers from the Moldova border. So it is certainly a bit of a concern. So we're really immersed in the in the whole war effort at the moment in helping the the refugees who are coming across the border. You know. And what does what does that look like, Jim? What, how are you how are you helping people? Um, we for instance we have two farm mini buses for for shift change. A lot of the year we run the machines night and day, so we collect them in from the villages and the tractor drivers, and we bring them here and there. So those minibuses are actually based at the border a lot of the time now to move people to different airports. And we're providing a lot of, we have apartments and houses on different farms because we actually have six different farmyards. So we've maintained all the houses. So we're using the houses and the and the farm, the, the farm apartments for young mothers with babies, you know, from one, from zero to, to three years of age there and because we're kind of a staging post they move on from here to other places in Europe but once they get across the border and the stress of getting across they get a few days to rest and and we're providing that and then we at one of our farms our organic farm we had put in in 2015 dormitories for summer workers and we actually have 26 um, who who need dependent living there are deaf mutes from an institution in the war zone so we have them and our farms team are looking after them and, and feeding because they need to live together so they probably will live out the war with us in our farm accommodation okay wow and would it be a similar situation jim with with other um farming companies or families i suppose uh, in, in, in everybody's romania? putting in everybody here in romania is putting in a huge effort the office of help and donations and because you, R- Romania, you know, suffered very badly in the Second World War. It was first invaded by the Germans because R- Romania is the only country in Europe with oil fields. So Hitler wanted those. So they were overrun by the Germans and then they were overrun by the Russians. And, and the old people in the villages to this day would tell you uh, that the, the German army were gentlemen in comparison to the Russians. So there's a very strong disdain of Russia here and what's happening. So there is a huge willingness to help the Ukrainians in their fight against the Russians. Um, you know, and, and it's shown in the, in the local opinion polls, you know, there was um, the anti-European party, you know, its support has dropped drastically. And I think there's 74% now people voted that they're hugely in favor of Europe and NATO because we are a NATO country. So that provides us great security, you know, that. We are in NATO, so we have the Americans and the rest of NATO to look after us. So that is a huge. And the funny thing, Mike, is when we were fundraising for here, we put a slide in the in the fundraising document about the importance of Romania being in NATO. Sadly, did I ever think it would come to this, that it would be so relevant. 
you know, well, being absolutely, in the uh, Absolutely. But uh, I suppose even still, uh, th- th- there must be a worry. Uh, and I know you're in NATO, the country is in NATO, but looking towards the East and, and, and what the Russia has done, I mean, uh, as you say, older people must still be nervous nonetheless. Oh, absolutely, Michael. And, and you know, they, they, the thing is that Moldova is the vulnerable one because they already, in part, Moldova does a Russian enclave and there's Russian troops there in Moldova. So there is a great, great concern. But I think as the days go by, we're seeing that the Russian army is being depleted and depleted. And the one thing the Russians do fear is the American army because it's just, the, the Ukrainians are winning because they have the best American technology available to them. The Russians have done very badly because a huge amount of their military spend was actually stolen and they haven't got the equipment that they thought they had. For instance, they have a huge problem with getting punctures because they got a big supply of cheap, cheap chi- tires from China and they're a disaster, you know? Okay. So the, the, the military hardware looks great in the parade in Moscow, but in the battlefield is a completely different, a different issue. Hmm. Go, go, just going back to, your, to, to the refugees, obviously they're from, from what we see in the news all the way from over here, they're still pouring across the border. Do, do, do you see your efforts in terms of your company um, that, that'll be a long-term effort from yourselves? Oh, it? absolutely. Absolutely. You, you know, we're, we're a staging post. At, at some stage, we'll become less relevant because they're moving on to Western and Northern Europe and they're anxious to do that and the, the doors are open for them. So I think we will have, as at some stage, that the flow of refugees will, will, that will slow down, but not for a while. I think we, we could have the worst week or 10 days ahead of us for the refugees. Okay. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's very easy to do it because they're very, a very um, obli- you know, helpful people and the Romanian people are really making a super effort to make all this work and happen, you know. So it's amazing how people band together. For, for just a small bit of context, Jim, you're more towards the towards Western Ukraine. A lot of the fighting is probably yes, maybe a yes. little bit towards the eastern side of it. I know My, you mentioned... I'm 400 kilometers directly south of Lvov. I'm 400 kilometers directly south of Lvov, and I'm 420 kilometers uh, west of Odessa. Okay. I'd say a lot of people might recognize Odessa as being I, one of the major I in, ports. I, I, was, I was in Odessa two years ago looking at walnut tree growing, and it's a stunningly beautiful city, and to think it's being bombed now is terrible. It's a beautiful place, absolutely beautiful place. It's an absolute tragedy what's going on in that country. Yeah, yeah. It's a disgrace Jim, what's going on. Absolutely. Jim, just, just turn it back a little bit maybe to your to your business, I suppose, as well, because you, you, you do have to do that as well. Um, in terms of how, uh, of all that over there at the moment, how is that affecting your business in, in terms of either selling what you have in store or maybe even getting access to supplies? Is, is, it, is it different today now? Well, it, it, Bulgaria and Hungary have, have banned exports, but the Romanian government said there isn't a problem. Last year was a really good year in Romania. And in Romania, you're rewarded for holding your stock as long as possible because the yields are growing and the hectares of crop are growing. So, and storage has continuously been an issue. We've been investing heavily in storage and we have very good storage, so you get paid for holding. So because of the good year, we had a lot of grain in stock when the crisis started, a lot of corn and a good bit of wheat, not much wheat. And so that we've seen a huge surge in price and there is no problem selling. The last Monday morning, there was a slight blip in the market. The traders withdrew for a while because they were afraid of a shipping ban, but the government confirmed, no, there won't be a shipping ban. So where it's been it, like for the business, we saw a very significant surge in prices, very significant. Um, I mean, if, if we go back over the five years before this, our average corn price X here was 140 euros a ton. We sold corn last week, or this week, for 310 euros. And, and like the oil crops are on fire, you know, not that long ago, we were taking 265 for sunflowers and we sold we sold sunflowers forward now at, at 650 for next October harvest in September and so from that point of view it's been a huge surge in prices but the thing is that western ukraine will start cropping there's no doubt about that um i see origin enterprises have opened up their 
the stores again for selling inputs uh, yesterday, and that will happen eastern Ukraine. Ukraine is responsible for 50% of the world sun the global trade in sunflower. So that that is why the oils are really on fire, because oh, because the palm oil business, palm oil and sunflower oil compete in the same market, and the palm oil people were having lots of problems. Malaysia had dry weather, and it had huge staff problems with COVID. So the palm oil business was all. Any fellow who's sitting in oilseed rape at home in Ireland is very, very good. I mean, we 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 sold some rape forward, and exactly a week later, we, we've got a hundred euros a ton more. A week later. So, I mean, there's, there's bits of trade being done here now at the moment for rape at 700 euros. Bits of power trade at 700 euros. Jim, can you go back just a little bit, um, just in terms of your, um, from the, the grain that you produce on, on your farm, which is obviously very substantial, 20,000 hectares. Um, it, that goes by road to the port, does it? Or does it go, go on to a train to the port? Or how we, does it get by, to the port? by train and by truck and by train to Constanta is where we generally go. Our organic produce goes north by truck to Switzerland and Germany and Austria. But the, the grains generally, a lot of our wheat goes, because of having very good storage, goes into the local trade. Not so, we, we, we don't sell that much wheat to Cargill and ADM. We sell some, but they take the soybeans and the sunflower and the other big bars and, and the corn. And and Jim, Jim, sorry, the, the Ukraine then they, uh, from what, what we read, they obviously have a lot of grain from last year still to be sold. Do you, and obviously, if Odessa is one of the ports that is being bombed into 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 last year, I suppose that's not going to happen from there. Do you see some of that grain being diverted through road into Romania out through Constanta? Possibly, M- mind you, the re- Ukrainian government have 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 banned exports just for the moment to try and see what to make sure that they have a, enough food going forward but that will open up again because the, you know we would contact with some of the farming companies in ukraine and they're in western ukraine they're ready to start seeding actually a number of them are spreading fertilizer these days they have better weather than us we have a bit it's very cold and a bit of bits of snow on and off with us we, we're having the january weather now with a very mild january very dry you know and this part of the world has suffered We've had a very dry winter. All Southern Europe has had a very dry winter. Spain and Portugal have had a miserable dry time. Water levels are very low. Since last, since the 1st of September, we've had 100 millimetres of rainfall to now. So okay. everywhere is dry. And if you if you add that into the mix, and I, I really don't believe that the, f- the future trade a month ago was reflecting the reduction yield was come from, coming from the lack of fertiliser, particularly nitrogen. You know, nation is an issue everywhere. Okay. And speaking speaking of which, are, have you got your own, for your own business, have you got that on hand or ordered or what way is that? We, we have it in, we have everything we need in stock. Um, we, 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 we've had a policy for, for a good while. We actually start buying in late July, August, because we need for the rape, DAP are a very good phosphorus thing for the rape and the wheat in the autumn. We're about 25% winter cropping and 75% spring cropping. So we actually now are facing into the seeding season where we have about 12,000 hectares to seed because we've only 25% of our crops. We'll seed about 15,400 hectares in total this campaign and 12,000 of that is to be seeded now. Starting, starting the 23rd, 4th or 5th, we start in the sugar beet. And then we'll wait for, we have to wait for soil temperatures for the soybean. Usually, traditionally, this the corn was seeded first and you seed the soybean. But actually, there's great work out of the US now saying seed the soybean first and then seed the corn. So, and because of the change of the fertilizer things, we've changed our rotation. But we've dropped our corn, our maize or our corn, as we call it, from about 40% of the total production back to about 35. Like we've gone from 11, 1200 hectares of soya up to 1900. And the same with sunflowers because they need very little nitrogen and a lot less P and K. So we've increased those. 
we've taken out the second corn. Second corn needs 40, 50 kilos more nitrogen. So we've taken out the second corn. And that's all a very conscious decision around the the, the, the cost or availability or both of nitrogen? Or uh, both nitrogen. And, and the pricing as well. You know, the, the pricing, the, the, you know, 650 ton corn, I'll saw it, sunflower, you know, just changes the, the whole dynamic of sure. finances of growing the crop. So it's very, and, and the, the soybean will, will be a very good price as well. And the soybean is just so wonderful to have in the rotation, you know, yep. as a crop. Yeah. Given back again, but in terms of in terms of your adjustments in, in overall fertilizers, um, the likes of P and K, uh, again they're expensive as well this year. Have you adjusted those as well as for as well as nitrogen? Well, we started this adjustment quite a time ago, Mike. Said that we had we had very high potassium levels in the soil, but an awful lot of it wasn't available because we had very high magnesium levels. So the magnesium was blocking the availability of the potash. So how we went about that then is applying a lot of lime. We would be applying, we would have applied lime to fields with a pH of six and a half. But the reason it was a pH of six and a half was that maybe 30% of the base saturation would be magnesium, which would make the, the potassium wouldn't be available. So what you really want in your base saturation is that your magnesium is 10, 12, 14% and your Calcium is 70, 72, 75%. And so we've put out over 30,000 tons of lime. So we have freed up the necessity to put um, potash in an awful lot of our land because our general potash readings are between 350 and 500 parts per million. It's naturally very high in potash. So now we've, so that's been a great saving for us. And, and then, in the, the from 2014 to last year, we um, we broadcast a lot of phosphorus and mixed it in as deep as we could to just build up the level. Because if you apply the phosphorus, so you have good ground levels. There's no comparison in the yield. Lands with naturally high levels will yield much better. So we've been doing that, and now um, we've changed our seed. La last year we spent a huge amount of money on buying new cedars. We we bought the 24 of Adestad Tempo cedars. So we're able to cut in now, because 75% of our, our crops are row crops, these cedars are brilliant because, you know, they, have, they hold five and a half tons of fertilizer. So for instance, we're seeding our corn now, we will be putting in two inches below and two inches to the side of the seed. We'll be putting a band of 45 kilos of active substance and 50 kilos of phosphorus, no potash, sulfur 10 kilos of sulfur and three kilos of zinc uh, in a band and it'll be the same in the soybean the same in some fabric be different mixes for them but we can do it with these cedars um, and and what we did as well when we bought our sugar beet harvester uh three years ago we got it like most sugar beet is at 450 millimeters here we got it, we bought halves with 450 and 500 because we were seeded when we bought the house, so we were actually seeded. So now all our sugar beet is at 500 mils, corn, soybeans, sunflowers are all in 500. So other than the organic business, all the conventional seeding, which will be about 11,000 hectares, will be seeded with four planters, the, 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 the 12 meter 24 row planters with four to 500 horsepower tractors on them. And now they're enormously expensive, they're 200,000 plus that each. But like seeding corn, seeding soybean, you're traveling at 14 kilometers an hour. And then seeding the sugar beet at 12 kilometers. And just to see the job they can do with 12 kilometers is just amazing seeding sugar beet. Having grown up in the sugar beet area, you know, to be seeding sugar beet at 12 k is just beyond belief. And the dust, every seed is there six inches apart. Every seed is just amazing technology. And, and Jim, is that is that control traffic that, that, that you're running as well? All, all GPS. We're, we're doing a lot of work with Trimble. And, and we, we spend, Michael, maybe 20, because of the scale of the business, we spend, spend between 25 and 40,000 a year continuously upgrading. So now the, when the guys, the seeders go in the fields, he, he, he'll just enter the field number. And so it'll then 
the, the, the GPS system will bring him round the field. He won't even have to steer because it's quite awkward with a wide seat as to steer. It'll bring him round the field and his AB line will be in place. And we run the four seaters in two, two and two. So the two seaters can go into the one field and they're just, they will be on the same AB line. So the guy will just see it every second 12 meters and the other guy will follow and they'll wipe out the field, you know? And so that, and if, if they have a problem, Michael, when he goes in the field setting up any problem, we have a software system that the farm manager or the two IT guys go into their laptop or their iPad, wherever they are, and they can win and see his screen and reset it for him. So the, the spending technology is wonderful. And it says all overlapping, the, the plants just count the seeds per hectare, which is very important for security, for corn seed. You will know at the end of the time. And, and the other thing is nearly all our corn will be variable rate seeded. Yeah. Are you variable rate seeding and variable rate um, putting out your, your, your nutrients, phosphates and zincs? No, no, we're blanket treating that still and we get to the, the level we want. But we are starting a trial with Syngenta on the variable rate fertilizer in corn. The, the variable rate seeding is, is in, a, in a, what we call it, we, because we have 550 millimeters for corn growing, we're known as a, a water restricted area. So our variable rate seeding really does a great job. You know, in, in the good parts of the field, Michael, we're up at 75,000 plants per hectare. And in the poor parts of the field, we're down as those. 55 and it really flat, helps to flatten out the yield and so you, you talked about the, the, the nitrogen you, you've, you've changed your cropping to um put more nitrogen fixing plants into into it and also to maximize the amount of sunflowers that, that, that are in it in terms of the the corn or the, the maize that you have within your system or even the beet in your system do you envisage cutting back some of your nitrogen um onto those crops or are you going to continue as was um, no, the, the, the what, what is, for instance, in the sugar beet, when we started growing sugar beet, everyone told us we needed 160 kilos of nitrogen a hectare, and we had zero sugar in our beet the first year, and the second year we dropped back to 130, and it got better, but we still had low sugars, and last year uh, we went to 100 kilos of nitrogen in total. And we had 17.8% sugar on 1,060 hectares, which was a, you know, which was great, you know. Okay, so you wouldn't be at high and, rates anyway, I suppose. Yeah. And and in, in the corn, Michael, one of the things that, you know, where we have a huge advantage is that our average organic matter is 4.8%. Um, because we're not, plow we stopped plowing from the minute we came here. And it, it just, the way the land responds when you stop plowing, to where the organic matter will climb using cover crops, using a lot of corn, using a lot of wheat, and baling nothing. Um, they really climb. And the thing is that for every 1% organic matter over the full season, the soil will release 22 to 24 kilos of nitrogen. So we're getting 100 kilos of nitrogen from our soil. So we'll actually only be applying to grow 10 tons of corn, we need 200 kilos of N in total. Now we leave 80 kilos of back in the field in the straw and a, and a 10 ton hectare corn crop, 120 kilos will go out the gate. And, and, and so what we'll do then to get the really bang, big bang for our buck is we will use UAN with drop pipes and drop it in on the road, six, seven leaves, just along the edge of the road with drop pipes and the trail sprayers. And so, so, you know, we're hoping to grow 10 ton corn crops, you know, if we get enough rainfall uh, with 100 kilos of N and 50 kilos of phosphorus and very little potash and 15 kilos of sulfur and three kilos of zinc. That certainly is quite, quite, quite low, even in comparison to an Irish scenario, which you'd nearly be slightly yeah, over well, the exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and and the, the, the fact, I, I'm amazed in Ireland that maize growing hasn't changed the row structure because there's absolutely great work to show that once you go north of 44 degrees north, you need to go to narrow rows. Like all the all the maize silage now in the US and in the Minnesotas and Dakotas and all that, all that maize silage is 50, in 15 inch rows, 375 mil rows, not, not 30, 30 inch rows. And so there is a very good response 
from Narrow Rose and Corn because you can then put put the plant, give much more space along the row to develop much better. So from from the perspective then of of, of what you're seeing in in terms of Romania or you, you're the region out there, are all farmers going to do similar to what you were doing, or are they doing something similar to what you it were doing? It does change. There's a huge talk about no-till right and and we, we have a lot of farmers coming to us about no-till and min-till and all the rest um having a lot of experience in south america of no-till i say to people converting from plow base to no-till is a seven-year journey because you gotta solve the, the compaction there from the plow pan you've got to get the microbial activity back you know you got to get your like your soil into her. You need the cal- calcium levels in your soil up at seventy parts per million because the soil won't be workable and won't be um, amenable, especially this heavy land we're farming here, because we've a lot of land that's forty percent clay, you know, and and you know, or only fifteen percent sand. So it's it's tough stuff and it gets wet very easily. But once you get the calcium into it then you open it up completely and then with the cover crops. And then what we're seeing, Michael, now with this is that seeding into a green cover crop in the spring with sunflowers and soybean and and, with, and not so much with the maize, but certainly with the sunflower and the soybean, there's huge responses, you know, huge responses. I suppose what I'm trying to get a sense of here is that where you think the overall production of grain is going to be in that region from the point of view of maybe slightly lower nitrogen, um, and you mentioned it being quite dry as well. The, the, and, and I remember last time we were, we were, we were talking in December, you, you mentioned that there was a big swathe of ground was very dry and there was a lot of winter corn didn't look so good at that stage. Yeah, the winter, cor- winter wheat has, has improved immensely. But from the big, big yields come from maize here. Um, and we're facing in, we need to be in the 1st of April storing plenty of moisture in the soil. So we're not facing into that. So we've downgraded our budget on wheat yields and we've downgraded our budget on corn yields because we are not we haven't got the amount of water. So, and, and as I said to you earlier, that I don't think the market was pricing in the lack of nitrogen in the thing either. So there will be, leave the Ukraine war aside, there's plenty of pressure on supply. So prices will be good, you know. Even if they ramp up production in in Ukraine, there will still be supply supply supplies will be tight. And and there's there's this huge issue, Mike, that no one has prepared to address yet. Russia is the biggest exporter of wheat. It puts 40, 45 million tons of wheat into the world market. Without that 40, 45 million, there's gonna be a lot of hungry people. So, you know, the, this is an issue. So it's a very, very interesting time, you know, because there's a, there's a lot more questions than there are answers. Well, a, I, I was going to say, I have another question or two kind of around that, and that's kind of where I was going next. And I know you slightly touched on it there in terms of you were saying Western Ukraine have, maybe the bigger farming companies have started um, putting out fertilizer and, 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 and planting. What's your gut feeling across Ukraine? Because obviously they're huge I, Well, in, in Eastern Ukraine, where the really good land is and the huge farms are, that is going to be a lot more difficult because that, that's where the Russians are. Uh, you know, that's, there is a train of thought in the, in the farm investment world that, you know, I was first told this in, in Singapore in 2008 that the Ukrainian agriculture was uninvestable until the, it would divide that, that Ukraine would be divided along the Dnieper River, Kiev, and east of the river go to Russia and west of the river go to Europe. And now I don't think that's going to happen because I think the Ukrainians have said, no, we're not going to let that happen. Ukraine is going to be in one country. We don't know what settlement there will be with Russia. So the eastern half of Ukraine, you know, will have plenty of problems. And f- simple thing, fuel, will they have fuel for cropping? Will the ports be able to function? What state will the ports be left in? You know, exactly. Yeah, and 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 you mentioned Russia, and and just in that, I suppose a lot of people are thinking about Russia in terms of they depend on on inputs. I suppose coming across from Europe as well in terms of you know um, ag chems and various other different things like that. How do you think, or what's the the, the the thinking in your circles as regards how Russia will 
be able to, to produce grain this year, will there be any exports coming out of there? They'll have no problem. Because it'll be a very profitable year in Russia. Because they, they um, remember, they pay their salaries and they pay for their fertilizer and their oil in rubles, you know. And the rubles have, fought, have just fallen out of bed completely, currency-wise. So they, they have such a competitive a- advantage already with that. Now, whether well, there are problems with customers, but at the end of the day, the customers will turn up because they need the wheat. So when people are hungry, you'll, you will buy. There you go. You know, when you're hung, hunger makes you abandon the high moral ground fairly quickly, you know? Yes, exactly. And so that, that, is, that is the thing. Um, the, you, Ukraine is, you know, is, is a very, very big producer of grains, you know, and, and is ramping it up. And the standard of farming is excellent there in comparison say, with Romania or with Russia. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but, it's, but the uh, Russians uh, have improved beyond oh, since 2014 in the sanctions. Russia has just upped its game completely. Really yeah. upped its game completely. Well, look, look I suppose in, in, in terms of, of the world market and the world market supply, if you're, if you're missing one or two percent, it can make a big difference in the market. Never mind missing, as you say, maybe. A, I don't well, Mike, we've, we've been through. Um, a year or two uh, of where closing stocks, the end of the marketing year have been dropping and drop, kept dropping. And so that's what creates the nervousness, you know. And, and that's where the big price spike has come at the moment that companies have been cut out offside without stocks. And they have to, I, I don't think the, the, the present uh, chaos in the market will be as bad um, because it's just, I think there's a lot of, People were caught without stock and have had to go into the market and buy at, at crazy prices. Sure. And I, I just read as well, and maybe your perspective on this as well, as there's a lot of countries thinking about protectionism, as in there, you mentioned earlier that um, Hungary and various other different countries have closed their borders to exports. Um, and I think that's kind of happened a bit, which, which will probably feed into this hunger for more grain as well, I suppose. Yeah, well, you know, protectionism just leads to inefficiency. You know, protection is, 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 you know, everywhere we see, see it, you know, the economies become, become inefficient. It is protection, that's what protection does. As a short, a very short term gain, but immediately becomes inefficient. It leads to great inefficiency. You know, the competitive free market, while it's fairly tough, it's the way forward, you know, it is the way forward. You know, you, you, you compete and you, you grow at that, you know, and, 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 you know, the countries that have the competitive advantage will come to the fore. You, it's like, for instance, our, our, the grass-based dairy farming in Ireland. They're just fantastic at what they do, the research that has been done at Moor Park. This, the model, that model is just so incredible. And I fall around the place in disbelief when you hear the Irish government want to, talk, to limit dairy production. Ireland because we're the most, Ireland the dairy farm is the most efficient producers. It's like energy crops, energy crops, the Brazilians are the people because they can grow sugar cane so cheaply and produce energy from it, you know? But so everywhere has a competitive advantage and protectionism just kills that competitive advantage. Jim, we're, we're after running out of time and it's been a real pleasure talking to you once again. Um, look, I wish you um, certainly all the all the um, support and moral support, I suppose, what we can give from, from here in terms of your your efforts dealing with the refugees coming out of Ukraine. And look, I, I hope you Continue that for as long as you're you're able to do it. Michael, thank you. So that's all we have time for. And my thanks to Jim for joining me today in the podcast. We'll come back to Jim in a few weeks' time to check in to see how he's getting on with his efforts with refugees and how his farming is going. As always, if you have suggestions about a topic you would like to hear about, drop me an email at michael.hennessy at chagas.ie or on Twitter at Chagas Crops. We always want to hear from farmers and people in the industry about what interests you, so please do get in touch. Finally, don't forget if you enjoyed the podcast, then recommend it to a friend or colleague. And as always, rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcast or Spotify so you never miss an episode. And for more information, go to chagas.ie. I'm Michael Hennessy. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with more tillage news and advice.